Hi guys, this is the Michael Myers Fanatic. Before we get into this interview with Chris Durand, I want to encourage you to follow me on all of these social media platforms that you see before you. And I want to do a quick disclaimer. I know that I spoke against the movie a lot in the past, but that was before I knew the entire story. And as I said to Chris Duran throughout the interview, I really liked his performance as Michael. And some of you are going to say, well, I thought you were against it. Yeah, I was before I knew the whole story. I liked the idea of it being a chess game between Laurie and Michael. You know, Michael was really sick. It was just a game to him. So... When you get the whole story, it sort of changes your outlook on things. And that's what it did for me. And maybe the same thing will happen with the Rob Zombie films. I doubt it, but you never know. Anyway, guys, here's my interview with Chris Durand. I really enjoyed doing it. The way he talked about being Michael Myers, portraying Michael Myers, and trying to kill Lori, it almost felt like I was speaking with an actual serial killer. So I enjoyed it. It was very creepy at times. Chris Durand is an awesome guy. I'm the Michael Myers fanatic. I approved this message. Here is my interview with Chris Durand talking about Halloween H2O 20 years later. Enjoy. I also want to point out that you may hear some yelling in the background. It's kind of funny. See, Chris Duran was recording near a pool area. His son was going swimming. So that's what you hear in the background. So I just wanted to make you guys aware of that. Hi, ladies and gentlemen, this is the Myers fan back with another interview, and I'm here with a very special guest. He played Michael Myers in Halloween H2O 20 years later. Please welcome the iconic Chris Duran. Chris, how are you? Well, I'm very well, thank you, man. It's good to be here, man. I guess my first question would be, how did you get into stunt work? How did that happen? Well... It, it was kind of almost accidental. As a kid, I would would play with uh, toys, and I would do little scenes that I'd create, and I'd do them over and over and over again until I got them just right, which was kind of, if you think about it, it's movie making. It's taking, you know, doing as many takes as you need to get what you want. Um, and then as I, as I grew up, I was just very physical. I was doing martial arts. I was kind of... Uh, doing all kinds of track stuff, learning some gymnastics, climbing. And I just did all these things anyway and played with my friends. And I realized that there was actually a job where you could do all of these things and get paid. Um, you know, make movies, tell stories. So uh, a friend of mine got started because his mom was an actress and, and got started uh, through a connection there and through a friend of hers. And then I, I kind of learned about it and then pursued it. Wow. So, I mean, what's the most dangerous thing you've ever done? This is always a tricky question because what looks dangerous isn't always what is the most dangerous. Um, I mean, I've done, you know, full fire burns being blown 50 feet through the air through a side of a building and blow it up in the same shot. But I'm pretty well buried in equipment and safe and have my guys on me and you know it's it's very um, it's very prepped and then sometimes the smaller things that don't look like much are actually more dangerous like if you just got to climb out on some ledge or you know jump off of some wall that's a little bit sketchy and, and there's kind of no backup so you gotta you know you gotta make it the first time have you ever been seriously injured yeah i a couple of small things. I mean, I fractured my foot 
doing an air ram for Angel, the TV series. Okay. Uh, I didn't know you just, were involved with that. That's cool. Oh, yeah. I did a lot of stuff on Angel. The first, first season or so, I was like a demon of the week almost. I was there all the time. I love and Angel. Probably the most notable was the Mora Demon. That was the first time Sarah Michelle Geller crossed over. Oh, okay. And she came to visit the show when it was just, you know, about eight seasons in, something, I mean, eight episodes in. Uh, and it was really picking up steam and doing well. And she came over and I was the demon that week. So I got to do a big fight with her there. Um, but I played, I played a ton of demons on that. I did the fight choreography on that for the uh, second season, I believe it was. You know, the first two seasons were real dark and real fun, and then it, it kind of became more like Buffy. It's a little more surfacey and silly. So uh, I was there with I, what I considered the good years from that. When it was really kind of fun. Yeah, it did go downhill a little towards the end for me. And I have to say this before I get into the Halloween stuff. I don't understand how such a nice guy can be so evil in a movie. How, how does that work? It's called acting, my friend. <laughs> that's, that's, I mean, uh, obviously, but you do it so well because by the time the film was over, I hated Michael. Like, I, <laughs> I, I really did. I hated him. Now, I, that's a combination of, of everything. I mean, I obviously have to uphold my end of the bargain and pull off my stuff. Uh, yeah, obviously, Steve Miner as well, setting the tone and how he directed it and, and it was cut together and the music and everything comes into play it's all got to work um but i've got to i got to figure this guy out and play my part and kind of bring something to it you can't just be some guy in a mask standing there because as freaky as that might be it's it's not enough yeah you have to bring more to it than that and i kind of had to figure that out on the fly uh, because I honestly didn't know what a big deal it was when I landed the film. I had no idea. The, the history of it, I just I just didn't know. How did you uh, get involved with H2O? Well, I got I got called in by Donna Keegan, who doubles Jamie, and had doubled her for years, and she was running the show. And Donna and I had worked together some years prior, and I remember goofing around on the, on the grass in between shots doing some gymnastic stuff and just hanging out. So she knew what I could do. Um, prior to her kind of getting involved, I understood that they they looked at about a hundred different people, different actors to, to play this and just weren't happy. And traditionally it come from the, the angle of hiring someone from stunts because it's a physical role. And she told them, I'll bring you five guys that are qualified. I'm not doing a big cattle call. And I was one of those five that she sent in. Um, so I went in and just met with Steve Miner in the first AD, and we were hanging out, just talking for a while. And they they knew what I could do from her. They saw my resume, you know, got to know me a little bit. And I think at the end of the day, the story that I got was that they were sitting there uh, talking, going, "Who do you want to hang out with for the next few months?" And so they they brought me on, which was awesome. And it turned, I found out later that I was actually Donna's first choice out of the five. She was pushing for me, so everything kind of went in my favor at that point. Well, I mean, have you have you ever seen any of the other Halloweens before before you did this one? No. Okay. And, and the, the story for that is it comes from that same interview. And when I was sitting there, listen, as, as an actor, if you go in and you see what are called sides, it's the little dialogue pages that they pull for you for whatever scene you're reading for. But there's usually stuff that's crossed out on there that's not part of your scene. But I always read everything because you might pick up clues that would give you more of an idea how they want things played, how the show is, etc. So you, you take every um, you take every little nuance and clue that you can to try to help you out. And so while we were sitting in the interview, they were talking amongst themselves for a second and kind of saying, well, we're not going to do what came before. So I filed that away. And when I got the show, I'm like, well, they said we're not going to do what came before, so why would I go and look at any of that? It doesn't matter. I guess that's now, true. Okay. Now, 
that was a happy accident because what they meant was we're not going to reference the in-betweens. So they're going to go 1, 2, and then H2O. They were talking about 4, 5, and 6. They weren't going to reference those. And I misunderstood them because I'd never seen them. So I didn't watch anything. I just went and did, you know, showed up and said, okay, what are we going to do with this guy? Well, we're not going to do a game before. Let's figure it out. And hmm. uh, it worked in my benefit because I didn't get in my head. I didn't try to second guess anything, and I didn't try to mimic anybody. I don't know. I thought you did the uh, the setup pretty good. You know how he sits up after being knocked down. I thought that was pretty good. Well, when we got there, um, you know, partway into filming, we're doing a bunch of stuff, and they showed me the closet scene because we were overlapping the closet scene, and I went, "Okay, cool." And then they they showed me one or two other things. I think sitting up, and then he said. We're kind of going to play back those, you know, work those moments back in as kind of an, an homage to what came before. And I went, fine, cool. But I literally saw it for a second and went, cool, okay. And then we did what we thought was right. But the, the rest of the time, I kind of just did what I thought I should do. And in this business, no news is good news. You know, you don't get accolades and praise for everything going great. You'll hear it if it's wrong. You know, so when nothing was being said you're like okay we're doing great and then every now and then steve would like giggle from the other room and you re you know you really nailed a, a shot and gave him a piece that he really liked um and that's kind of how it goes with this whole thing you know so we didn't we didn't over think it from that perspective like we didn't over orchestrate it a couple technical things about like the head like they show me the head tilt okay so the iconic one from h2o is me standing kind of full body with the head tilt and then I, I go after the, the kids and you know but that was half about getting the glint off of the knife and you know taking that moment and giving them time to run and all that stuff but they showed it to me right before that like this is his thing and I was like cool okay well I mean that, it, have you than that Steve let me go and he let me do what I thought was right so um it turned out I was I, I Yes, I, I figured out the character. Have you seen him since? Or No. Okay. Because uh, I was going to ask you, one of the questions that I had here was, of all of the actors who portrayed Michael before you or after you, who was your favorite and why? But since you haven't seen it, I guess I can't ask you that. Well, I, you can't ask which performance is the best, but they're all really great guys. Uh, I've known some of them separately through stunts over the years, worked with them on other projects, um, you know, gotten to know others at conventions, and everybody's a really pretty up and up guy, and straight shooters and, you know, hard workers and, and nice guys, so um, nothing bad to say about any of them that I've dealt with. That's cool. Well, when you received the script for H2O, what were your initial reactions? Did you like Did you like the story or Yeah, I mean, you know, listen, it, it, in one sense you're so happy that they hired you for a lead um, that you almost don't care. <laughs> okay, I understand. <laughs> but then, you know, you read a script and you you get a vision in your head of what it's going to be and I thought it was clean. Um and then as you start to go, you start to see it unfold and you see what, what Steve's vision was for it and, and kind of what each department was bringing to it in terms of their expertise and kind of the mood and the setting and, you know, bringing it all together that way. And, of course, you, you meet all the other actors and you kind of see how, how it's going to play out. Um, and then you get more and more excited as it goes because I had a phenomenal cast around me. Um, it, you know, obviously, you know, top-notch filmmakers who really care, you know, and I, I always go with the idea that I'm there to be part of a bigger picture and part of a bigger team. So as it unfolded that way, I was very, very happy because then you know you're going to get a good product, whether it's, it's your kind of a story or not, you know, if it's your favorite kind of a movie or not, you know it's going to be done well. What was your favorite kill in the film, and why? Do you have a favorite kill as Michael? I, I, yeah, I think there's, um, 
there's probably a couple of favorite scenes, but I think the kill that was kind of fun to do character-wise was when I killed Adam Arkin and I lifted him up with a knife. Yeah. Um, because there's a real moment of, I mean, there was a technical trick to making that all work. Um, but there was a real moment, too, of, of having to play that beat down the hall to Jamie with the intensity while I was killing him. Because it wasn't, it was not killing him. It was killing him to get to her. Yeah. You know, psychologically mess with her. So I think that had a lot of layers to it. And so I really enjoyed that. Now, my a very good friend of mine doubled at him for the part where he, I pull the knife and he falls down. And there's no easy way to do that aspect of it. Except he had to jump up in the air and then go flat to his back on a solid floor. So I did not want to do two takes. Right? I wanted to nail it in one. So we had to be timing, you know, dead on. Um, you know, intensity dead on. So it's one of those challenges where you got to be, you got to be uh, on your toes and really focused and in character. So all of those things come into play to what made it my favorite. Um, but you know, there's there's other stuff that was fun to do, and there's obviously some that you don't see. Um, you see the aftermath, which is also a smarter way to do the film to me. Instead of seeing me kill everybody. I don't know. I, I kind of wanted to see you kill more people. Yeah, but that's good. It, it's kind of the same thing that people say when they go, oh, it's too short. And they go, oh, the movie's not too short because it left you wanting more, which is good. Because it didn't have like five false endings where it kept going and going. And then you're rolling your eyes going, come on, you know. Yeah. It, it was it was clean. I mean, once, once we met, when we meet up at that door, it's on. And then it doesn't stop until the very end, and then it's done. And there wasn't kind of any, you know, the one false um, false ending is, you know, she thinks I'm dead, and then I come out of the bag in the ambulance. And, but it's, it's basically once the chase is on, it's on, and there's no turning it off until the very, very end. So it had an intensity to it, which I think would have been lost had it been a longer film. And I think there's a psychological factor that gets diminished if you are too graphic and you see too much it's kind of a psycho effect you know the shower scene you don't see anything but it resonates with you and it's scary well i mean it definitely affected me psychologically because after i learned who you were i was like chris duran is really mean <laughs> <laughs> not really Cause that's what I was. I was like, I was literally thinking that as a kid. I was like, I, I was like, I hate that guy. He's so evil. <laughs> it's as I say, I'm a, I'm a Gemini. I, I leave that side at home. You know, I leave it. I only let it out at work. That's that. It's it was just so terrible. You were just so terrible as Michael. I think of the first eight. I think that was the most violent he's ever been. So. Yeah, now there's a, <clears throat> there's an aspect of it again that kind of ramped up because you do you do a lot of psychological build up, which is where Steve was very good with this, and again I was very happy. Um, you kind of build up, and the whole premise to me is you're messing with her, and and part of what I really really liked about it was it wasn't a typical se sequel where everyone's kind of happy go lucky again. You know, she was messed up. Yeah. You know, she was she was having flashbacks. Her kids now, the age she was, and all this happened to her, and she can't. She's drinking and doing pills, and you know she can't handle it. And she's having, um, you know, having visions of me. So you so this, it layers it where you don't know if it's me or not me. You know, if I'm actually there, and it just keeps building until that moment when we come face to face, and that's like I said. Then you know it's on, and and then. When she comes to fight back, it's like really on. Yeah. Right? When she goes back with the axe, and so now it kind of ramps up again. I mean, I she definitely. Through time. She definitely. She. I'm sorry to interrupt. I have to say, she definitely. She laid the smackdown on you. She. She. She definitely kicked your ass toward the end there. You know, so. Right, but that's all. That's what makes it so exciting. Is that it's not guaranteed outcome either way. 
But as you get there and the intensity builds, I mean, now you're in it and you're in the fight for your life. And it's not kind of this run and fall down in the woods and, you know, twist your ankle kind of stuff where every kill is kind of the same. You know, the kills leading up to that are to build up the audience and also to build up her. Like I said, Adam's kill is, is not so much about killing him. He's incidental. He's, he's only important because he's connected to her. Yeah. And so he's, you know, and this is the same thing with the table scene. If you think about the table flipping, mm -hmm. the thing I loved about, that was one of my favorite scenes to do, but the thing about it is it's kind of like a reverse tsunami. If a wave is coming at you, so think of a zombie movie, there's a wave of zombies coming at you. That's one kind of scare because you're getting overwhelmed. But now if you do this in reverse, it's this reverse wave, and I'm taking away her safety. Every every flip, I'm taking away her hiding spots. So it's not more, it's just me. But she's getting less and less opportunity to get away from me. And, and it's like, now you have to face him. Yeah. And as it goes, it's more and more of a situation where she has no choice but to have this battle. And I was just going to comment on that and say you were taking away her safety net so to speak right we're taking away her hiding places yeah and, and you know it take killing adam was taking away you know one of her her big um you know supporters in life right this is her significant other and, and i took him away right in front of her so and i was just about to say that so it's like Okay, no more running, no more hiding. You're going to face me. Let's do this. Right. Once we got face to face on the door, it's on. So it was a game to him. Yeah. A sick game is what I'm saying. Yeah. Okay. The ultimate, the ultimate goal, in, in my mind, is to get to her. But there's a lot of ways to get to her. There's physically getting to her, and there's emotionally getting to her, and mentally getting to her. You see, you know, I, I have to say, if you don't mind, I'm just enjoying this conversation. Um, I'm sorry. I'm just a big fan. Um, I I noticed that, uh, like, it's like a game of chess. It's, you know, who, who's going to win? It's like you bring so many layers to Michael. And these are things that I never noticed before tonight, believe it or not. And I'm a huge fan. Well, and then my idea, and listen, I, I'm coming into this, I, I'm, I, I try to think things out the best I can, or to solve the puzzle the best you can, and to me, I went in, again, with no preconceived notions, which really helped me, because I didn't get in my own way, but also, kind of no direction, and realizing very quickly, I'm just some kind of mask, and the mask itself is is freaky but that only gets you so far and music gets you further and lighting gets you further and all this stuff but if you're walking down the hallway just kind of walking down the hallway you're just some schmuck in a mask it doesn't mean anything so there, you really got to bring something to it there's got to be an intent you've got to have a purpose and so i had to figure out kind of what what is this guy's intent like what is his energy for all of this, and you may have heard this elsewhere, but what I landed on was a large predator, a cat. Mm -hmm. If you've ever seen a tiger or a lion, you know, lock eyes on prey, it's frightening because they go into a feral mode where you cannot break that gaze. And so that's what I would do each take when I was stalking somebody is I literally stalked them. I tilted my head down and I locked eyes on them and I growled very, very deep down in my chest, which the sound guy picked up on and, and kind of layered in, I guess, or at least he said so for um, part of the soundtrack. Um, but that was kind of my intent each time. It's like, look, I'm coming and I, I don't have to be in a hurry and I don't care what you put in front of me, I'm coming and you're not stopping me. And that was kind of how I played it, you know, each moment as I would be chasing somebody was kind of that intensity of you know you're you're doomed it doesn't matter if it's right now or in 10 minutes or tomorrow but i'm gonna get you this is so intense i never thought about 
him this way. And like I said, I'm a huge fan. I talk about Michael every day or almost every day on the channel. And I never looked at him this way. I think I might watch it tonight because of you. You you inspired me to look at it tonight. Okay. Um, I, listen, this is my take on stuff. This is how I dealt with it. And, you know, and, and I tend to want to put purpose behind stuff. I want it, I want each scene to mean something. I don't just want them to be a bunch of filler or, or kind of, you know, pretty shots. I mean, pretty shots and compositions are, are important. But if that's all you have, it's, it brings hollow. Um, if you can bring a little bit more depth to it, it, you know, even just a little bit, it makes a difference. And, and the big lesson I learned with this whole film was that, look, I'm, I'm behind a mask, and for the most part, you don't see eyes, I don't have any expression, and I have no dialogue. You know, here's your mask, be scary. Yeah. What do you do? What do you do? You know, you've got to have some kind of a, an energy to it um, for it to ring true and the big lesson that I learned is that intent translates somehow on camera and that's kind of the magic of film like I said if I was just you know kind of ah, phoning it in you know whatever I'm here I'll chase the guy down the hallway it doesn't really read the same way whereas if you just put that energy into it somehow it, it came across on film so it paid off I think what I'm dealing with here is somebody that takes their job very seriously. And for that, sir, I respect you. I really do. Well, thank you. Thank you. I mean, I know I'm just a fan. And my opinion is, you know, it means next to nothing. But I think I'm looking at somebody that takes it seriously. And ironically... Uh, when I first when I when I first saw H two O, I liked it. And then I had like a love hate relationship with it, and now tonight I see it with new eyes. So, um, I think you did a uh, I think you did a good job. And I guess my next question would be: In two thousand two, Dimension Films released. The very controversial sequel, Halloween Resurrection, as you know, right. and uh, and so why weren't you in the film? And is there anything that you would have done differently with the character? I don't know if you saw Resurrection. I think you said you didn't watch the other films. So, uh, no, but so here's here's my take. The first thing I need to say is that before the first day of principal photography for Halloween H two O, we knew that there was a sequel. The deal was that Jamie wanted to finish the, season, the series mm -hmm. um, and have a, a, a definitive end and consider an H2O the third in a trilogy. But of course the producers were never going to do that because that's their bread and butter and that's their franchise. So there had to be a device to carry it on. And so I knew what the device was before we started filming. And that was the deal that she made to give them a couple minutes of screen time for the next so they could carry on the franchise. But this was really her last hurrah. Of course, many, many years later, she changed her mind and, and came out with the newer ones. Um, in terms of uh, being hired, the way that these productions often go is that you have somebody who owns the franchise who then will hire a production team that is often usually different completely than who they hired before and they will hire their people okay so even if uh, they loved everything I did which they did it's a different crew different people and they were also in Canada and so to save money they went and hired local you know so am I am I offended by that no and I'll tell you why um, if you look at it in, from my perspective and you say, were you offended you weren't hired to replay this character? I, in honesty, I would have to say, then I should be offended that Nick Castle wasn't brought back for every one of them. Yeah. Right? And the fact that they didn't bring Nick back was what allowed, afforded me the chance to play Michael. All right? Mm-hmm. 
Okay, so now the fact that they have a different production in Canada, why not hire local, has nothing to do with me or what job I get. It has everything to do with what business little deal they're doing right then, in which production company they're working with, etc. Um, so, you know, it's you're, you'd be offended at nothing, right? It's, yeah. It's blaming somebody who doesn't even know you and they don't really care. Now, the other aspect that happened through the years in my opinion, is that the producers didn't really want someone to gain traction as Michael. And they also saw me as expendable in the sense that during the filming, I had the crew coming up to me many times, different people saying, if we lose you, if something happens, we're screwed. And my answer was, if you lose me and something happens, I get injured or something, there'll be somebody else in the mask tomorrow. They don't care. And that's the unfortunate truth of it. They're looking at it as a business. They never saw it as somebody more than a guy in a mask that was interchangeable. And as, as you can tell from what I'm saying, I saw it as something very different. It's a character, and it needs to be consistent, and it needs to have something behind it, right? Yeah. But but the business reality is, you know, had something happened to me, had I gotten sick and not been able to go on or, you know, broken my foot or something, um, somebody else would have been a mask the next day and they'd have just kept filming. And, well, they, and they wouldn't have batted an eye on the production side of it. As I Everyone said, knew. I'm sorry to interrupt. I just wanted to say, as I said before, I had like a bit of a love-hate relationship with it. I did want the four and five and six references that I did not get. Right. I wanted... Um, more screen time with Michael. It's a, and it's not me being disrespectful. I'm just, no, you know. Everybody has the parts. Listen, the really crazy thing about this franchise is that some people absolutely hate H2O, and some people it's their favorite, and some people love five, and some people love six, and someone goes, oh, two is my favorite, but no, one does this and that, and I wish there was, you know, and every, everything across the board, right? So every combination you can think of. There's somebody who likes something better here and better there or wanted more of this. So it, it's kind of a no-win situation in terms of, from my point of view, of trying to please people. And what I tell people is, look, had I played Michael differently, there'd be people who loved it and people who hated it. Yeah. And it's just a fact because it, there's people want different things from it. So at the end of the day, my job was to try to figure out this character the best I could and tell the story that we were telling. It's not the story that I wrote for a bigger franchise. It's not, wasn't my choice, right? I didn't have anything to do with that. I'm a hired hand to come in and, and pull this off. Um, you know, so it, it, you get misplaced, uh, people being upset that are misplacing their energies because it's not us. It's, it's the whole production and it's the whole franchise. Yeah. But there are people who absolutely dislike H2O for a variety of reasons and it's perfectly valid to them. Not offended by it the least because what I did is went in and did what I th thought was right. Right? And then if they get mean about something, if anybody ever gets mean about it, <laughs> the response is basically just to say, well, when you play Michael, you do it your way. Right? You're right. And, and, and that's all you can do because, you know, and I don't want to be mean about it because I just did what I thought was right, you know, and I know the other guys did too, right? And you're doing, dealing with the situation you're in at the time, um, you know, what, I like the fact that we weren't too graphic on the kills because I think it's more psychological. Uh, I get that people wanted more screen time, but my argument against it is, you know, you wanted it for a reason. And it kept you in suspense, right? Just like you wanted the movie to be longer, but had it been longer, it actually would have been, you know, less of an effective movie, right? Yeah, the fact that's true. That you want to see Michael Moore, that you, that you want to see more kills, you know, is not an invalid point, but, but the counter argument is that it, that means we were effective in telling the story because. We, we didn't just give you everything on a silver platter. We, we left you craving, right? That's and, true. And it also leaves you off balance because you don't know if he's going to be there on this next bit. And you don't know if he's, you know what I mean? 
It's good. So there's a there's a couple of movies. I'll, I'll give you one example. Uh, just what I think is a mistake. There's there's a film, and I won't mention the name, just out of respect, where you get glimpses all along of the creature, and at the very end they do this like 25, 30 second shot close up of the creature because they were in love with their creature makeup and kind of their their animatronics and all the stuff that went with that. But to me, the longer you sit there and see the creature, the more you study it, and the more you study it, the more comfortable you get with it, and the less scary it is. You know, I have, makes, yeah, I absolutely, it does, and I, I love your take on the character, and uh, I wish you could come back for another one, and we're almost done. I have a few more questions here. Um, sure, now, you know, Danielle Harris, I don't know how familiar you are with her, she actually expressed interest in doing H2O. Uh, you know, if she were to come back for a Halloween movie, would you come back and be Michael and do that whole connection? You know, with Michael and, and Lori's daughter, would you be willing to do yeah. that? I mean, it would be fun to come back and play Michael, but as, I, as I've told people in the past, it's kind of got to be right, because... Look, I got a, a perfect storm uh, in terms of getting to play Michael, being the 20th anniversary, having Jamie back, having a phenomenal cast across the board, having her mom be in it, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, it was this, this perfect storm of good stuff that happened. And it was a good script, solid script, you know, well-directed, um, good sets, the whole thing, right? So when you look at the next iteration and you say hey would you come back it's like yeah it'd, be, it'd certainly be fun but I'd, I'd have to kind of really look at it for a beat and, and say is that the right thing to do is it the, is it a good story is it the right story etc um, not just blindly go yeah yeah I'd do it yeah. because, because I, I've seen you know not the movies so much as the reactions to and, you know, and know all about them just from those reactions. And it's like, yeah, well, you don't want to, you don't want to step backwards in a sense, right? Yeah. Um, you know, and, and they, I hope the best for stuff because you want them to work. You want them to be good, right? Definitely. And, yeah, but it, it's a, it's, it's a yes, no. It's. You know, not trying to avoid it, but I think it would have to be a good situation again. I was one of the people that was constantly saying H2O this, H2O that, and just, you know, hammering it, and you know, but now, not anymore since I've spoken with you, <laughs> you know. Well, I'm glad I changed your mind. <laughs> so, uh, I guess my, my next question would be, um... Well, it's kind of a two-part question. It's like, what were some of your favorite moments on set? And then what were some of your least favorite moments? And then after you answer that, I was going to ask you, uh, according to the original film, on the evening of October 31st, 1963, Michael murdered his sister, Judith. What do you think went wrong with Michael? I, I know these are like long questions, but... Let's start with what's wrong. What's wrong with Michael? Yeah, like what? 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 What happened to him? Why did he do that? That's that's a tough one because I kind of stepped past that when I was looking at it. I kind of stepped past it into the what you call an archetype character. Mm -hmm. um, and at that point, the archetype just became the killer, and the killer had a purpose, and it, and it almost it didn't matter anymore why it, it mattered who right? I like that I, I like that okay so he so I was kind of already past that level like he's already become kind of this this creature if you will so let me let me add something with that thought that just sprung to mind so one of the debates when we were first kind of lining up to do camera tests and test different masks and decide what the design was going to be etc um, was whether the mask would be tucked in or not. Hmm. Okay. That's interesting. My thinking is if the mask is untucked, as an audience member, I, I see a mask and I want to rip it off. Right? Yeah. And I know it's a guy in a mask and I want to grab the mask and I want to pull it. Um, if it's tucked in, 
it, it blurs the line between a guy in a mask and an actual entity in and of himself. Does that make sense? Yeah. Now he, now he becomes his own entity. He's, he's no longer a person hiding behind this thing. He is just Michael. I I just I I I like what you're bringing to this conversation. I'm telling you, you've definitely got to come back. I know Blumhouse is no, they're they're doing their own thing, and I'm not going to step on their territory. But I'm telling you, if I ever got into Malik's office and I got to do my film, which is never going to happen, but anyway, um, I would definitely want you back. Well, thank you, sir. That that would be my uh my terms and conditions for that and I'm going to go to uh, my Let me answer your other question real quick because you were asking favorite scenes and yes. favorite moments and yes stuff. sir uh, favorite scenes real, real quick favorite scenes are the, the porthole window when we come face to face mm -hmm. uh, flipping the tables and probably reaching out at the end which was very very tricky because I had to be three things at once uh, I had to be Michael who got the snot knocked out of him saying, what have I done all these years, you know, forgive me. I had to be Michael playing her and saying, just, just a little closer, just touch my hand and I'm going to end it. And I had to be a paramedic who was taped up in this thing going, what the hell happened? Who, where am I? Help me. All of those three things had to read somehow. That was by far the trickiest thing to do. Um, no real direction in terms of how to play it other than what I just told you. Like, you're all of these things. Like, yeah. you're this guy, but you're also Michael. Okay, do your thing. And I'm like, ah, uh, okay, what am I going to do, right? Um, well, probably the trickiest or hardest nights, because we did what's called splits, so we'd go in kind of midday and work till midnight usually. Um, with some of those, we worked later and we were out in the mountains until, you know, kind of all night. And it gets really, really cold at, you know, four in the morning. Um, and you're doing something like coming out of van window to the dirt. It's uh, it's kind of hard to get warm. And <laughs> it's a little tricky. Um, but all that stuff we did with the van coming down the hill and pinning me, uh, that's all hard stuff to do just because of the situation that you're working nights, you're late and cold. But otherwise, I mean, I enjoy people and I enjoyed what we were doing uh, immensely and it was it was a pretty fun film to do. if you were called upon to battle another icon like if you had to fight Jason or Freddy right. which you know who would you choose and why who would you want to fight as Michael oh, they, they'd be very different battles to me uh, Freddy would be more of a psychological game it'd be more of the chess match you're talking about yeah There'd be a lot, and I think that'd be a lot more interesting in terms of how it uh, kind of played out. Uh, I think if it were Jason, you'd be it, it would be that more violent Michael, where it's uh, you know if you're rocking and rolling, um, very different kind of energy for both. I now, agree with you. I, I think it'd be trickier to pull off. Uh, with Freddy because you'd have to be really clever about how you filmed it and what you did um, with Jason it'd be like a you know a great MMA match where everyone would just do leather <laughs> you know? yeah yeah and I guess be, go ahead I'm sorry no that's it Oh, um, so I guess my final question, even though you sort of already answered it, I, I was going to say, if they decided to follow the original series, meaning one through eight, would you be willing to come back as Michael? But I mean, I guess you sort of, you know. Yeah, I mean, I, of course. It, it, but the, again, the situation would have to be right. I don't think, it, you know, it, it seems like they, they lost their way in a lot of movies. Um, a lot of series do this where they, they start to get kind of cheap and want to pump them out yeah. instead of really taking the moment and thinking it out. I'd rather do something, you know, I'd rather do one movie that's really, really good than do three movies that are mediocre. Well, I again, I agree with you, sir, and I'm not trying to blow my own horn. I'm just saying I feel like I can do that. You know what I mean? As a right. As a writer, I feel like I can do that. 
Well, when you have when you have a passion for something like that, you actually put the thought into it, and you work out all the little machinations and all those moments and, and pieces that really make a difference. And that's what I'm saying is you got to be careful because you might get a script that's just very surfacey, and you know, or they they try to bring in names just to pump it up and sell it that way. Yeah, the names names don't make a good move. I mean, I agree a, a thousand times where you, you hire somebody because of their name and the movie's crud. Yeah, um, I definitely you know, agree there. So I'd rather it be a smaller movie that's done right than a big budget movie that's that's kind of phoned in. That's what I planned on doing. Right, and I and I would much rather again have something that's been conscientious and everyone's really thinking about how to pull it off and do it in a neat, clever way and, you know, and, and be engaging versus just kind of doing kill after kill after kill. Yeah. Um, you know, that has its own place and its own effectiveness, but it's just much less than if you do it properly all the way through. And my mom, like I said, she's such a huge fan of the series, of the series and she told me, she said, you gotta tell that guy, meaning you, she said, you gotta, she said, you gotta tell that guy, thank you for not killing LL Cool J. Well, there was a, it was a little bit of a scare with that, right? But that was part of the fun of it. Um, yeah, she's very welcome. Shout out to your mom. Oh, thank you so much, Chris. I was just gonna ask you to give her a shout out. She loves the film. Excellent. Well, tell her I appreciate it, and I hope she continues to enjoy it over the years. Well, Chris, I want to thank you so much for doing this, and thank you for letting me, you know, get my opinions out there. I'm just a fan. That's what I always tell people, but... Well, no, don't, don't downplay that, because honestly, without fans, none of this matters. You know, it doesn't matter if you do phenomenal work and it, and it sits in the closet somewhere. When people get to see it and then they appreciate it, that's what makes it worthwhile for all of us. And to know that there are fans out there who care about it, care about the details, want to know information about it, are interested after all these years, is incredibly flattering. And, you know, makes things, uh, makes it worth doing the work. Right, it's a it's a collaboration. To be honest, not just to get a film done, but the follow up when you have a fan base that really understands it and appreciates it and continues to. Well, you know, there there is no just a fan. How's that? Fans well, are, are thank you so much. Franchise. I appreciate that. And again, I want to say that if I ever got a chance to do to do the film, I would want you back. And you know, I hope that happens. So I hope it happens too. Thank you so much for being here, Chris. I, I can't I can't express my gratitude enough. Thank you. Well listen, I gotta scoop, but have a great night. Same to I you, will, sir. Uh, I will hear from you online and let me know when this comes out and I'll talk to you guys later. All right, thank, thank you. For you. Everyone to listen and being interested in being fans over here. Thank you guys. Thank you so much, Chris. Okay, gotta go. Bye, sir. Bye bye. All right, ladies and gentlemen, and that was my interview with stuntman Chris Duran. Uh, he was talking about his role as the iconic Michael Myers in Halloween H2O 20 years later. This guy has given me a totally new outlook on the film, and I want to thank you guys for listening to this interview. Thank you very much. I'm the Michael Myers fanatic, and I approve this message.